Welcome to the Tech Ed Podcast, where we visit with leaders who are shaping, innovating, and disrupting technical education. People who are not afraid to think differently, not afraid to try something new, all with the goal of securing the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. Welcome back to the Tech Ed Podcast. I am your host, Matt Kirkner. And if you have listened to our podcast before, you know a couple things. One of them, and it kind of goes without saying, is that we absolutely love technology here on the Tech Ed Podcast. Of course, it's right in our name, and I would owe that fascination with technology in many ways to the house in which I grew up. We were the very first house on the block to have a microwave oven, believe it or not, back in those days, the idea that you could put something in a box and take it out a minute later and it would be hot was like earth-blowing, mind-blowing, absolutely incredible. And we were the first people on our block with a microwave oven. The first ones on our block with the VCR, same thing. Could you believe actually being able to record a TV program on the television? At the time, we had three channels, but we were the first one on the block to have a VCR and the first ones on the block to have a personal computer. And so I grew up in this family where technology was a big deal. My parents were into technology. As a result, I'm into technology. I'm also hugely into music, and if you're a regular listener, you know that as well, and we talk about all kinds of genres of music. I'm into all kinds of genres of music. We had last year the executive vice president of Fender, the guitar company, on with us. We talked all about my fascination with music. Well, in so many ways, those two worlds collide, and so I was huge into music tech when I was growing up. I was huge into having the biggest speakers of anybody in my college dorm. We had the biggest speakers, the loudest stereo, the first cassette deck with high-speed dubbing. That was a crazy thing back then. So all these technologies. And what's interesting is that we've got that convergence of music and of technology. We talk about the convergence of art and technology and manufacturing here on the Tech Ed Podcast quite often. So many of the tools that I used to listen to music, to watch video, surround sound system in my house, speakers in every single room I purchased from today's guest's company. That is an absolutely true story. And so we get to talk today with somebody really, really interesting. It's going to be a a really fascinating conversation. Before I get into that, though, we have to just dwell for a moment on the evolution of technology and the evolution of music. This last weekend, I was playing DJ at home and I followed up a Frank Sinatra tune with a young gravy tune. So talk about like spanning 70 years of music as I was playing DJ at home, lots and lots of interest in music, but that interest has evolved over time. Technology has evolved over time from the CD players and the cassette decks that we used 30 and 40 years ago to the streaming services like Spotify and Apple that we use today. Tremendous evolution in the world of music, tremendous evolution in the world of technology and tremendous evolution in corporate America. That's what we're going to talk about today is that we are seeing tremendous and incredible evolution in the world of how companies are looking at all kinds of things, including community engagement, including inclusivity, and including education engagement. We're going to talk with about all these today with Tequila Lopez. She is the Director of Social Impact and Community Program Operations for one of my favorite retail and now online companies, Best Buy. Tequila, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. And thank you for choosing Best Buy as your retailer of choice for all of this great technology that you're purchasing. Absolutely. You have you have never gone wrong buying from Best Buy. The service has always been fantastic and the, the technology has always been great. The support has always been great. I know we're going to talk a little bit about how you prepare individuals to create that amazing Best Buy experience. So absolutely glad to be your partner. Now, let's start off here. When most people think about Best Buy, Tequila, you know, they think of you as an electronics and technology retail store. And that, to be honest with you, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind for me. But your work at Best Buy over the last more than seven years has been about a much bigger mission. So tell us about the side of the organization you work on in areas like diversity and social impact. What's the mission and vision of these efforts for Best Buy? Absolutely. So, you know, people have always been at the center of what we do at Best Buy. Um, And I think it's in a very humble manner that we sustain this culture that values having fun while being the best and unleashing the power of our people and being able to let those things shine through. I'll give you two really quick story or examples when I say humble in that when there were the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, 
you know, we sent out planes full of supplies for all of our for all of our employees that were there that you didn't hear about that. But that's what we do because our people were in need. And we even brought some employees to the mainland to be with their families that were here because um, their spaces there were were not habitable. In the midst of COVID, we established something called the Hope Fund, which has really proven to be a lifeline for our employees where they may need additional financial help for unforeseen circumstances, um, such as a death or bills need to be paid and so on and so forth. And, you know, so, I mean, we really, really, really have kept people at the center of what we do. And a lot of the choices that we make have been around what's going to be best for that employee so that they can then give you the great service that you've received over time. So when, you know, when you add on this layer of diversity and social impact from an inclusion and diversity side, um, it really is having this diverse workforce that reflects our communities. From the social impact side, and for a lot of what we'll talk about today, it is building brighter futures through technology. It is all around having our teams, which is our future, be able to have access and creating the spaces in which they can do that. I think the, the whole idea of building better futures through technology, I mean, that rings obviously so true to me. It is it is crazy how the, the world, the business and how corporate America, larger companies and, and Best Buy would certainly qualify the evolution in the way that that companies in general are looking at their workforce, looking at their people, understanding that people have challenges both at, at work and outside of work, but those have tremendous overlap. And to the extent that we can, whether it's being humble and helping our employees in Puerto Rico or, or providing employees who may be going through a, a tough or a rough uh, path in their, in their overall journey, uh, providing them that lifeline of support, really, really important. And it's fascinating to me to hear companies stepping up and, and finding ways to do that. So it's one of the reasons I've been really, really interested in this overall conversation. It touches a lot of things, right? It touches the employee experience. It touches talent acquisition. I know you've got a background there. In fact, before stepping into your current role as director of social impact community program operations, you served in various roles related to, to talent acquisition and to diversity. How do those types of programs that, let's say, especially serve youth, tie to the talent acquisition and diversity strategy? It ties seamlessly, right? Like, so the youth that we're inspiring today could very well be the talent that we're hiring tomorrow. The beautiful thing about our Teen Tech Centers is that we serve an extremely diverse student population. And we wholeheartedly believe that through our programming, that we're creating pathways, not only for Best Buy, but also for many of our partner organizations that have joined into the effort. Because when you think about a talent pathway or you think about um, inclusion and diversity, it's the long game. Like it, it's not this immediate right now, you put in a program and bam, you're gonna see results. It, it truly is the long game. And so they all tie together very seamlessly for our youth and for our company. Um, when we think about increasing our, our diversity efforts, increasing our talent, increasing our pathways and our opportunities. And the other thing is the jobs that we will have in the future don't exist today. So it's really cultivating that talent now to be able to step into those roles when they emerge in the future. And roles that we might not even know today what they're going to look like in the future, to your point, preparing people for jobs that don't even exist, which to me is really exciting and really fascinating. I really appreciate the focus on the long game as well. I won't mention his name, but I have a friend who's a uh, a CEO of a of a large Fortune 500 company uh, who's really worked on diversity and inclusion over the course of a decade, and uh, and they've been successful. They not by the way not as successful as they had hoped to be because I think there's still a lot a lot of work to do. But but they've been very successful relative to other large companies. And he gets you know other corporate CEOs to call and say, hey, how did how did you figure out this diversity and inclusion? So quickly, you know, what do we need to be doing? And his first answer to them is if you're just doing it to figure out the quarter or figure out the year, don't bother. It is a long game and it's got to be part of your culture. Exactly. You have to be doing it for the right reasons and not just to be able to write an article or to, to say, hey, look at what we're doing, but but doing it for all the right reasons. And it's clear that, that that's the case in, in your particular case. And with Best Buy is, is looking at what is that long game. And I appreciate you bringing that up. As you look at that long game, Tequila, what are some of the key initiatives that you're working on in, in your present role? And I'd also be interested in, and I know our listeners would be interested in, when we look at diversity and inclusion, when we look at how we inspire a new generation toward technology and towards the careers that exist in that space, you know, what are some of the ways that you can measure success of those efforts? 
Yeah, so one of the biggest initiatives uh, for our team is around this concept of operational excellence. So we are creating the foundation for expansion and sustainability by driving teen tech center programming to brand new heights. So as we look to open another 50 teen tech centers over the next three years, um, we're also looking at the number of teens that are landing internships and jobs within STEAM related fields. And we're also considering what influences their participation in our programming? And then what is the influence that has been placed in their post-secondary options or education? So basically by being a part of this Teen Tech Center programming, did that then influence you to take up um, a STEAM field post-secondarily, whether it is in a two-year, four-year credentialing, whatever the case may be. We talk a lot on the podcast about the influence, to your point, that experiences and interests on the part of middle school students and high school students have as they're going through whatever their pathway is and what, what a huge impact those experiences have on their ultimate career choices and on their ultimate jobs that they, that they take on, whether it's post-secondary, whether it's, you know, whether they're going on for additional education or what have you. It's those interesting experiences that have the single largest impact on what they choose. And it sounds like, is that, is that exactly what you're seeing? It sounds like that it, like it is. That is. And we do longitudinal study. We have a longitudinal study um, for our alumni so that we can then truly track like the efficacy of the programming and what is happening in the long run. So again, all of this goes back to this long game piece and we are shifting and moving so that we are meeting the needs of all of the youth that we're serving. Absolutely. To Quila, we've not, we've talked a little bit about the teen tech centers. You've mentioned that a couple of times, and I'm, I'm sure you've whetted the appetite of our listeners a little bit to understand what is that all about? Talk about, you know, who they serve um, and what services the teen tech centers provide. Awesome. So teen tech centers are the safe after school spaces that are housed within nonprofit organizations that are equipped with cutting edge technology. And then they're also staffed by youth development professionals that provide a safe and supportive learning environment. So I get really excited because if you, if you ever have an opportunity to go into a teen tech center, when I say cutting edge technology, it truly is. Like we do podcasting in our teen tech center spaces. We have four recording studios, but then we also focus on things like photography. We have teens that have been able to use our sewing machines to start their own like micro enterprise of uh, selling their clothes or creating their prom dresses. There's one of our teen tech center sites where three different of our teens created their prom dresses in our space, sold them fully and went to prom. But the teen tech center is the model when we talk about what we provide. So the model itself, which was developed out of the MIT Media Labs, the lifelong kindergarten group, and then it was operationalized in partnership with the Clubhouse Network has these four guiding principles. And they're around projects, peers, passions, and play. So projects, we encourage youth to ideate, create, and iterate. Uh, peers, fostering creativity through collaboration and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, passions, providing an opportunity for teens to work on projects that they deeply care about. And then play, supporting risk-taking, and then also celebrating failures as part of the process. You know, oftentimes you're told you have to be great, but there is so much greatness that comes in failure. There's so much learning that comes in failure. And so the team tech center space is really, you can just come and explore it. it there, there isn't a set curriculum. It really is today. You may want to learn how to draw on a walk on tablet. Tomorrow, you may want to learn how to make beats for an album that one of your friends wants to rap in the studio. Like it could be any and everything in between. Well, we're going to have to do our next conversation from one of those teen tech centers right in the podcast studio, right? So we, we can do that. We definitely, we definitely yes. need a need a sequel. And with it sounds like fifty of them opening up here in the next in the next year, we'll have an opportunity to to do that just about anywhere in the country. So we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But it struck me as you were going through the projects, peers passions and play the play part of that and, and encouraging risk taking on the part of these young people. So important. And then you back through those other three P's. And as we talk to industrial employers, those are in so many cases and employers across the economy, in so many cases, technology companies and so on. Those are 
the very personality traits that they look for in individuals that they want to bring into their organization, right? How do I work on a project? How do I interact with other individuals and, and create peers out of my coworkers and create friends out of my coworkers and so on? How do I follow those things that are really, really important to me and important to others? And then, and then finally, where we started it, how do we, how do we make sure that people understand risk-taking and that it's okay to fail and we'll celebrate success and we'll celebrate failures. That's a really really interesting model. And I think in many ways mirrors, and I'm sure you put some thought into that. And that's the reason for the four P's, right? Mirrors the type of personality traits that companies want when young people are coming out of various programs and into career pathways. So let's, let's talk now about those career pathways themselves. You know, a student or a young person is involved in a, a teen tech center. Tell us about the career pathways programs. Yep. So teen tech centers, all exploratory, right? It's wild. You go free. Career Pathways is where we actually get into structured curriculum. So that program provides career readiness and hard skills training to teens that are interested in pursuing careers in STEM or within the creative economy. Um, and so they, they are able to participate in curriculum over the, the year, and then it, it helps to strengthen their skills in the specific career focus area. And so by the time they complete the program, Participants are equipped with plans for post-secondary education, their career. They have pieces that they can add to their portfolio, like hard skill, tangible things that they can take from it. For our teens that are 16 years or older, they also have the opportunity to participate in a paid internship over the summer and then also continue on a part-time basis um, after that. So career pathways really is when we say you know, we're able to say we put our stamp of approval on this youth when we think about an internship because because you're learning the soft skills that you just spoke about. But then we're also marrying that with the hard skills that they get from this this year long of curriculum to say, yep, this team is going to be ready to go for an internship or a job with your company. So if a student is listening to a young person is listening to this podcast and is like, oh, my goodness, I need to be a part of this. How, how do they learn more? How do they how do they connect with the teen tech centers? Oh, teen tech centers are easy. So teen tech centers, you just go to uh, bestbuy.com or slash teen tech center, and you'll be able to see where they're located. We have 50 teen tech centers that are open currently, and we're building another 50 all across the country. So if there isn't one in your backyard or neighborhood, there may be one very soon. Yeah, with 100 of them across the country, they can't be far away once once you get those second 50 off the ground. So fantastic. And I know you know, students and young people can come come to the tech centers for all of the things that we've already talked about. They can also come for mentorship, right? And that's a topic that comes up quite a bit on the Tech Ed podcast. So, uh, you know, you touched on how the teen tech centers are staffed to some degree, but talk about the role of mentors, why it's so important for students to have a mentor in their high school years. It's super important. So one of the things that we measure is the sentiment of having a caring adult or caring adults within the teen tech center space. And the mentors who engage with our youth are also included in that measurement. Um, we know that being able to draw from the experiences of adults that may look like the teens that are in our centers, that may come from those same backgrounds, same communities, the representation piece is, is super important because you can be what you can see oftentimes. And the other piece is just having someone that is taking the time to pour into you their time, talent, and treasure so that you're able to get a little bit further. One key thing too is that mentorship, you know, the earlier that a person can gain or, or understand the benefits of mentorship, it'll help them throughout their full career because you don't stop getting mentors in high school or in college. Like you have grown working adults that are looking for mentors. But once you grasp and understand mentorship, then you can then be able to take that relationship and move it into a form of sponsorship. And I, I think for me, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about sponsorship with mentorship, especially as we're talking about the youth that we're serving, because what we know mm -hmm. is mentorship can get you so far, but there's a ton of power in having those people speaking on your behalf in rooms that you're not able to get into yet. And in some regards, our mentors do that for our youth because they mm -hmm. allow folks to take a chance, if you will, of saying, hey, let's hire this team. But then as you continue to grow and get older and own your craft, being able to show up for that mentor in a way that they are now willing to put their own social capital onto you to sort of sponsor you, if you will, will take you that much further. 
really, really valuable experiences. And I think one of the things that young people don't realize, in fact, I know they don't realize many of them, is that people want to help you. I mean, as somebody who is established in their career, some, you know, sometimes you feel like you're imposing on that individual or why would they help? They want to help you. They, you know, they want to be a part of your life. They want to you know, impart their wisdom. And in a lot of ways, having been on both sides of the mentor relationship, I know you have as well. Uh, there's oftentimes as much value that comes out of being a mentor to somebody as, as, as being mentored by somebody and eventually being sponsored by somebody as you put it, I've got to believe given, you know, given the levels to which you've risen in, in Best Buy and in, in corporate America that you had a mentor or two along the way. Can you tell us about a mentor that was important to you? I can. So the first person that comes to mind for me is a woman by the name of Carol Morrison. We used to work for Best Buy. She's no longer with the company, but she hired me into Best Buy. And she was so much more than just my leader at the time. She really, truly was a mentor because she poured into me from her own experiences and helped me to be even better, right? It, it, it is, I'm telling you thing, these things, not solely as your leader, but as someone who is invested in your success and who is invested in making sure that you're able to have the runway that you want to have with nothing to gain, right? You know, and so as I worked under her and then even moved on to other um, departments within the organization, I always went back to her for advice and guidance on how should I navigate? Am I thinking about this in the right way? Can you be my mirror? The other piece that I greatly valued was the constructive pieces of feedback that I received. And, and so a lot of times we want to hear all the good, but we don't want people to be that mirror and show us the bad and trust and believe she would sit me down and say, Hey, this is, you're not showing up well. Right. And, and I'm telling you this because I care and this is how you do better. So I greatly, greatly, greatly value all the ways in which she poured into me as a leader, as, as a, as a human being, as a person, as a friend and showing me how to be the best leader that I could be for the people that work for me. Perfect. Great example. Any others that come to mind? Carol was a perfect one. Carol was great. I mean, I another mentor that I had was actually Carol's boss in Best Buy, who's no longer with us either. I should probably think of people who are still here, <laughs> but in Best Buy. But um, a mentor is a mentor, right? A mentor is a mentor. Right. I mean, Rosalind, Rosalind Cheryl was the best that ever did it in, in my mind when I, when I think about just having someone to look at, to admire and to model behind. Um, and I think that that's one of the things too, like you get these mentors, people mentor you. And they're also people who show you how to do something. They model the behaviors, they open doors for you in a way that they don't have to, but they do because you also pour into it too. And you kind of touched on this. There's something that you can get out of being a mentor as well. And oftentimes it's when you have a mentee that is showing you that what you're pouring into them is not going to waste, you know, and then they're able to come back and say, Hey, I did this one or two things. Now what's next, you know, and then you want to continue to give and give because you're like seeing the fruits of that labor. And so the same thing with Rosalind, um, if I had anything, if I had an idea or a question or just a, looking at the way in which she would respond. And for me, having a female person of color in a high position, there was that representation piece of this is how you can move and be successful in this space. And here's how you shouldn't move, to, you know, if you want to be successful. Um, and, and I would say that these people started out as mentors, but because of the work that I put in and the value that I was able to show then moved into being sponsors for me and speaking up for me even when I wasn't in the room. And I do have others within the organization that have done that for me that I'm grateful for because you never know what someone says, how that can or cannot affect how you're able to grow and move. Absolutely. Great answers and, and great examples, both in Rosalind, you said, and Carol, Is mm -hmm. that, did I get the names right? Yeah. yeah, both of them just absolutely, absolutely fantastic examples of of mentors and so many, so many great gems that were buried in that last answer. You know, I think you know, part of what you talked about is, is finding a mentor that is willing not only to encourage you and tell you what you want to hear, but also give you that constructive criticism and say, Hey, there's a, there's another way to do this. Or have you thought about it this way? 
um, you know, to me, the, those were always the people that made the biggest differences in terms of my, my career pathway was somebody that was willing to tell it like it is. And yeah, sometimes it hurt. And sometimes you'd, you know, you'd walk out of the meeting feeling like, um, you know, maybe it didn't go like you, you had hoped it would, but then you'd go home and you'd think about it and you'd come up with a new strategy. And then you look back on it a year later and it's like, oh, thank goodness that person had the guts to be able to, to tell me that. So as young people are looking for mentors and people that they can model themselves after, make sure that you find somebody that will be genuinely honest with you and, and when they need to be brutally honest with you so that you can learn both the, the good and the bad and continue to move in move your career and your life in the right direction. So we're going to change topics a little bit now with Tequila Lopez, who is the Director of Social Impact Community Program Operations at Best Buy, and talk now about the Geek Squad Academy, which is another great example of how Best Buy is giving students skills and real world experience for tech careers. So let's turn our topic now to what is the Geek Squad Academy? Talk about this program. Geek Squad Academy is so awesome because it can be looked at as the spark that opens up a young person's mind into what's possible. Um, so these are two-day camps that provide students with um, the opportunity to develop tech skills, uh, build self-confidence, spark creativity, um, and discover how technology can benefit them in their educational pursuits, as well as their future careers. Um, it's all about creating these fun projects with accessible technology, and, and they all get uh, deemed junior agents. So we have our Geek Squad agents. So they all become junior agents. How old are they? Was they going through this out of curiosity? So these are a little bit younger. So I think 10 to 12 year olds. Got it. I'll tell you personally, my son, when he, he was a little bit younger, he's like eight or nine when he went to his first Geek Squad Academy camp and fell in love and was like, oh my God, I want to do it again. I want to go to this place. I want to have a, like, we had so much fun because they learn initial things like circuitry and we have all these cool toys like Makey Makey, which means nothing for me just saying it. But um, if you think about, you know, things like taking a banana and using the electricity to, to make things light up, right? So we begin like these basic fundamental pieces that are fun that you can see, touch, feel and go, wow, I didn't even know that this was possible. Um, so we do these all across the country uh, with various nonprofit organizations. And we also have like smaller versions of them that we started this year. So if you maybe you don't have two days and 200 kids, but you have one day and 30 kids, that's fine. We can still do some in-house, in-school type activities that begin to spark that creativity. And then hopefully you go, I really enjoy this. And there's a teen tech center nearby. I think I'm going to go to the teen tech center, you know, shortly after. Yeah. The spark that opens up a young person's mind. I like the way you described that, you know, you think about, and we talk a lot here, getting to young people when they're really, you know, when they're young, when, you know, that's a lot of folks don't realize that there are a lot of, especially girls, believe it or not, that will turn off to certain career pathways in, in technology and engineering, sometimes in STEM and in uh, manufacturing is an example as early as like fourth and fifth grade, you know? So, I mean, you can be, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old and turning yourself off to entire career pathways because you may not believe that those career pathways are available to you. In fact, a lot of times when we're talking to employers who maybe are still just kind of figuring out their strategy when it comes to getting young people excited about careers with them, we'll say, well, we need to get to the high school seniors and juniors and tell them what's going on. Well, that's great, but that is way too late. And we need to, yeah, we need to start at a much, much younger age. And it sounds like that's exactly, you know, exactly what you're doing. I will tell you, there are a lot of days, probably every day I wake up and I'm like, oh my goodness, how did I get so lucky to be able to wake up and have the, the life that I have and the family that I have and the friends that I have? You have to tell that son of yours, how in the world did he get so lucky to be born into a family where, where his mom is a senior leader at Best Buy and can open them up to all these really, really cool opportunities. So congratulations to him as well for that opportunity he had to be involved with the Geek Squad Academy. We love those personal stories here on the Tech Ed Podcast, making those successes personal. And I, I'd love to give you the opportunity to Quila to, to talk about a story about how the programs that we've talked about already have impacted individuals' lives. Is there a story of a particular student who participated in one of your community programs, for example, that has left a special impact on you? I can give you two quick ones if that's okay. Please so, give us as many as you got. All right. Great. So I I came into this role in April. So um, I've been on social impact team for a year, but I came into this specific role in April. 
And so now I'm able to dig really deep and learn and meet the students and those kind of things from across the country. So one quick story is, and it talks a little bit about the value of the programming, but also kind of the second chance. So we launched our internship program this summer within our retail space. And we had one of our students who the general manager called to do an interview with them for the internship. And the student said, oh, can you call me back because I'm playing a video game right now, right? And the, the GM is like, what, you know? And we were like, please, we'll take care of it. Net, net, move forward three months later, this GM can't do anything but rave about the student. He's like, he's the best employee I hired this summer. Now, if you think about that, any other person would have said, wait, you blow me off because you're playing a game? But yet, because of the programming, because it's our programming and these are our students, here's that second chance. And it just shows the power of a second chance because he's like, I'm so glad I didn't write this kid off because literally he is a rock star and is the best person that we hired this summer. And then this one's a little a somewhat smaller, but it impacted me. I went in to visit a site in Pittsburgh. And um, I was talking with one of the one of the girls there and she was saying, yeah, she loves drawing and we were connecting through anime and a couple of other things. And she was just asking me a few things that I liked. Um, so I told her how uh, my favorite band is Corn, and I have a pit bull that's, you know, that's my baby and these things. So net net, I go, I have some conversations with um, with the leader of that of that site. And then I come back and she goes, I commissioned this drawing for you. And it literally was a pit bull with his hands like this with corn on the t-shirt. Because I was like, oh my God, is that corn on that shirt? And she's like, yeah, I made this for you. I was like, what do you mean? And so she like drew it and then they put it, They we have the press right huh. there, the screen printer right there and made me a shirt on the spot. So my first piece of, like teen made gear was personalized and commissioned for me. And my smile was from like cheek to cheek. That's awesome. And they just so yeah. happened to capture it on video because they were doing a documentary that day. And all you see are teeth and no eyes and a huge smile with this really awesome shirt that one of the teens made for me. That's a great story. Of all the directions, I, I didn't think this was going to go. Corn was on the list. But oh, I'm... we can talk about this after this. <laughs> I enjoy Matt. corn as like, well. That's corn with a K, right? 28 years of hits, okay? Well, not 28 years worth, yeah, but they have, that's... they're great. Yep. Awesome, awesome, awesome example. Both of those are just fantastic examples. And, you know, you think about, you know, the value of a first impression, obviously a lesson for a young person is if the general manager calls, maybe telling him that you're playing a video game, maybe not the best look if you're, if you're trying to get an internship, but the, the other side, I think that a lot of times people lose sight of and that, and that I think we're getting away from a little bit here in, in this ultra competitive war for talent, if you will, is giving people those second chances. And, you know, I happen to grow up in a family where there were certain expectations and you kind of knew by the time you were 10 or 11 years old, what you could say to an adult, what, what you couldn't. My parents said, you know, set some pretty strong rules around things like that. Not everybody grows up in the same environment, right? And and so here's a young person who, for whatever reason, better or for worse, maybe didn't recognize that that was an inappropriate way to respond to somebody who was calling about an interview for an internship, but giving that individual that second chance and showing them what was possible and showing them that pathway to a really, really cool career made a huge, huge difference in, uh, in that example. And then, of course, the girl in Pittsburgh, that's another fantastic example. And and the fact that you managed to weave corn into the discussion as well, even, even better. So, you know, those are some individuals that had access to technology, that had access to these types of opportunities. That's not the case for everybody, right? And I think another thing that, that sometimes we forget about is that, you know, there isn't a, a job today that doesn't rely in some way on technology. And, and you could really almost say that every job in this, in this economy is a tech job in one way or another you know, from your expertise, what happens to students in under, underserved populations who maybe don't have that access to the relevant technology in their education pathway? And, and what do we do about that? I think they're left at a deficit to compete. When you don't have this access, then you're not able to compete in the real world for viable jobs. And if you think about how fast technology moves and works, and even for those of us who have some understanding of technology, you know, 
it's kind of hard, especially the older we get to like keep up with it all. So think about a child who has the capacity to learn and take in a lot of information easily and quickly, but they're just not given it. And then by the time they do get access to it, you are way behind the curve of those who had it from the time they started school because they were given an iPad, whereas we're still working off paper, right? So it's even those little small things of how are we utilizing technology in the school system today and those schools who have iPads and computers that are given to them versus those students that are still writing on paper because the school can't afford it. It just sets our youth back. And, you know, one of the things that we're working on is lessening that digital divide and creating equity within the digital space. And that's a lot of the work that we do from a philanthropic standpoint, as well as all of the programming that we've talked about today. It is to close that divide and give access and give awareness to students who may not have it in, you know, in their school or at home at least they can get it in these spaces so that they're able to have some foot in the race to be able to, to make a difference in their trajectory and their outcomes for their careers. You know, one of the most interesting and kind of indelible marks that was, was left on me during COVID was I was at um, driving by one of the technical colleges. I'm here in the state of Wisconsin where we have technical colleges similar to a community college, maybe in other parts of the country. And it was maybe two or three months into the, the pandemic and I, I drove by a technical college parking lot and there were like a couple dozen cars probably parked in that parking lot and, and they all had people in them. And I was like, what, what is going on? And I, I had a conversation with the president of that technical college. I said, what are all those people doing in the parking lot just sitting in their cars? He said, those are the students that don't have access to broadband at home and want to learn remotely and can't do it at home. And so they have to come and sit in a car in the parking lot of the technical college where they have access to broadband. So first of all, credit to that college for finding a way to give those students access at a time when, uh, you know, when, when not everybody had it, but it was really an eye opener for me. When you think about even recording a podcast like this, you know, the importance of a broadband and of a wi- Wi-Fi connection. And, and if you're somebody that doesn't have ac- that kind of access, obviously it's a huge, huge disadvantage, not just in competing for jobs, but in giving yourselves the skills and the competencies that are necessary when you get there. So it's an interesting experience that I had, you know, for our employers that are listening today and and recognizing this is a problem, and I'm sure many of them do, how can they get involved in helping ensure that students in their region have the resources and tools they need to succeed in today's tech-driven world? Create opportunities to give hands-on experience. Yeah. Like I I would say that first and foremost, I, I think we're in this interesting time where employers are feeling the shift between how talent has traditionally uh, come into the workplace and what the new norms and expectations are. And so if you think about even that story of the team that I mentioned that was playing the video game, sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper to find this really awesome talent. And quite frankly, a lot of it is in our backyards. A lot of it is in their backyards. You just have to be willing to look for it. You have to be willing to recognize that the way that talent comes to us today may not be packaged the way that it that it has been in the past. And what are some of these non-traditional ways in which people in the past that they've taken, knowing that they can still be a valuable asset to that organization? You know, for us, we're looking for employers that are willing to host high school interns and then hire them. Um, we're looking for employers that are willing to take or train students and then having an open mind to that non-traditional path. So I I would say, you know, create the spaces or partner with organizations that have already figured it out and then create the jobs because there's exposure, there's hands-on training, an internship is a nice way to try it before you buy it, and then you got to buy it right? But you got to consistently have these opportunities. And I will mark on there having paid opportunities because we want our students to not have to choose between learning and earning. Hopefully they can do both. And I want to go back to what you said at the at the beginning of your answer, which I just think is absolutely, absolutely true. And, and I, I got it close. You said the talent comes to us today uh, in ways that it may, it may not be packaged in the way that it was in the past. And I think that that's exactly right. And I can just tell you from some of the businesses that we're involved in and the way those businesses have grown with kind of non-traditional individuals that found their way into technology, found their way 
into uh, into the education space. Um, there's some of the best people that you can find. And they've got these other experiences that are just incredibly valuable if you kind of look a little bit under the surface. So I think both of those really, really good advice for our listeners today. I want to give you one more opportunity to tell us where to go to learn more about some of the programs you've talked about today. And then we're going to get into our last question. So for the folks that have been as fascinated by this conversation, Tequila, as I have been, uh, where do they go to learn more about, uh, about all the things that we've talked about? Go ahead. Awesome. So Teen Tech Centers are pretty simple. Bestbuy.com forward slash Teen Tech Center. No S's. And then um, if there are any schools, nonprofits, or other community organizations that are interested in hosting a Key Squad Academy during either the summer break or for an in-school field trip, you can email academy at geeksquad.com. You can also find more information at academy.geeksquad.com. And I'm sure we're going to see tremendous amounts of traffic there because the conversation has been absolutely fast, fascinating today. And, and you've given some great answers. You've given us some great information. You've also given us some really good advice. I think you had great advice for anybody who is looking to find a mentor, for anybody who's interested in being a mentor, for any employer who is looking at ways to access an incredible layer of talent that maybe they're not getting to today. One last piece of advice that we'd love to ask you about, and that is if you could give any advice to a high school sophomore, what would that advice be? Never underestimate the power of curiosity. There is something so profound when you just exercise curiosity. You're able to learn. It allows you to be open. It allows you to take chances and risks. And it's not something just for teens. I think human beings as a whole, because when you're curious, then you let go of all of these like preconceived notions because you're coming at it from a space of like wanting to learn and wanting to be. A lot of times we want to say no to things, but if you exercise curiosity, you'll say yes. And then you get to be open to being surprised at what happens on the other side of it. So I would just say never underestimate the power of curiosity. She is the Director of Social Impact Community Program Operations for Best Buy, Tequila Lopez, telling us to never underestimate the power of curiosity. We couldn't agree more, and we can't thank you enough for the time you spent with us today on the Tech Ed Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe, leave a review, and if you like this episode, share it with a friend. New episodes launch every Tuesday, so listen in next week. 